We're, we're here to talk about uh, the, uh, the man on the screen, Alexander Finister Proctor. He led a long and happy and productive and reproductive life. He had eight children. He was born in 1860 and died in 1950, about two weeks short of being 90 years old. Uh, uh, and uh, I kind of thought about the reasons for his longevity. One of them was he never drank and never smoked. Take that as a lesson. He was mar happily married for 35 years. Take that as another lesson. He ate a lot of wild game. I don't know if that really works, but it sounds good. He and his wife uh, had eight children. He never took any care of them. That's why he lived longer than his wife. <laughs> but he did, he did uh, care for them. He sent them all to Yale and Stanford. They all had college educations. And he was passionate about his work, and I think that keeps people going. Uh, now, if I can get this to work, yeah. He had two different sort of periods in his life, and the first was up to 1913, when he does the Q Street Bridge in Washington, D.C. Up to that date, he had been an animalier sculptor, meaning he had focused on sculpting animals, and he did every kind of animal you can think of except for possums. Elephants and monkeys, horses, no rhinos, let's see. But, it, but, but he did, he, he was expert at rendering animal form. And that's what he did. I, I never did count up how many animals he did, but there, there were a lot of them. And then in 1913, after he does this monument, I mean, it's the largest buffalo in the world. You can see it from a helicopter. Maybe see it from space, I don't know. 13 feet high. He decides, I'm going to do something else now. And so he turns to Western life. A lot of his animals had been Western, and we'll see that. But he turns to Western life and Western heroes. And so uh, after that point, he starts doing monuments. Now, he doesn't do his first monument until 1920, but he, his ambition is to do monuments of a similar scale to the Q Street Buffalo. Uh, for the remainder of his life. And he does about tw 12, 10 or 12 uh, monuments, including this one here, which was dedicated in 1927 in Kansas City, the Pioneer Mother. And I think it's one of the great uh, monuments in history, and I've always thought it represented uh, a sort of feminist ideal. There weren't many male sculptors who cared anything about feminism. But he quoted uh, Mark Twain by saying that the, that the pioneer women did everything that the pioneer men did, and then they had to live with the pioneer men. <laughs> and I always thought that her posture in this bronze, leaning forward, her chin out, offering her young child to the West and, her, and its future uh, was a feminist gesture, and that the men were incidental, and then, I saw the third rain. Oh my God. He's leading her horse. Is that terrible? So I'm going to Kansas City if, uh, with a, a crew of sculptors uh, with a blowtorch and take out the third rain <laughs> so I can continue to brag about Proctor as a feminist sculptor, okay? It, just like he, he shared a two-part life as a sculptor of animals and then of Western heroes, uh, he himself was a two-part man. You can see in these, young, in, in these photographs of him as a young man. He wanted to be a sportsman, a hunter, an adventurer, an outdoorsman. And when he grew up in Denver, he spent most of his time in the mountains. But he also had this cosmopolitan side. He wanted to be a fine artist. And so he and Charles Partridge Adams, who was a painter in Denver, had a studio on the fifth, fifth floor of the Tabor building. Somebody wrote, he had, they had the whole, eight, the whole fifth floor. I don't think Tabor had the whole fifth floor, but uh, they did have a studio there, and, and they were serious. And his father, interestingly enough, not many artists' fathers of male would-be artists 
encourage their children to become artists. But his father said, I dream of the day, Fim, I think he called him Fim, that you will be, uh, will, will find yourself in a studio in Paris or in Rome. You're that kind of a, of a character and you can make this happen. And his father never saw that happen, but he did uh, follow through on that. This was his mentor, a guy named Harrison Mills. And Harrison Mills uh, was a New York painter and had come to Colorado uh, to uh, help his wife recover from TB or something, some, some illness that was caused by smoky cities like New York, come out to Denver, which has clean air. Well, maybe it did for a few years <coughs> back then. Uh, this was his mentor. It was, a, it was a comp that same combination of the man of the outdoors and the man of the studio. And so this was his hero. Well, at age 25, Proctor woke up one day and learned that Mills' wife was OK. And they were moving back to New York City. Now what will I do? And so he says, well, I'll, I'll take dad's advice and I'll go back to New York and study art. But he didn't have any money. So we went into the mining business for a while, almost blew his head off. Uh, he tried all kinds of other adventures. Uh, and eventually, the one asset that he had was a, uh, a cabin uh, uh, in the mountains near Grand Lake off of Berthet Pass. And he sold that cabin uh, to a friend of his. And that gave him enough money uh, that he went and started taking classes at the National Academy of Design. <clears throat> well, there was a guy there named Warmouth, Walmouth, Warmouth, something like that, who taught drawing and art, basic art. Proctor wanted to be a painter, so he had to learn how to draw first. And he hated this guy. And so a year later, oops, yeah, a year later, uh, he signs up for the Art Students League. And this guy, uh, Carol Beckworth, uh, was his hero. He really taught Proctor how to draw and how to paint in Proctor's mind. And so he stayed at the Art Students League for quite a while. Now, every summer, he would go back west to, to uh, exercise that other section of his personality. Uh, and so he would go hunting uh, with his friend, Charles Partridge Adams. This is a photograph taken in 1883, but they continued to do this well into the 1880s. And the year he was uh, a student at the uh, our Students League, he came back with a mountain lion hide. Now you can imagine how these people enjoyed that. <laughs> this is what he pe uh, pinned up in his studio. Oh, Finn, this is really wonderful. Good for you. Uh, at any rate, that shows that this second section of his life was never given up. And then this fellow came along, about 1890. Uh, and his name was John Rogers. And John Rogers was the, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Norman Rockwell. See, I knew somebody knew that. The Norman Rockwell of sculptor, sculpture in that era. And he taught and encouraged Proctor to be, I mean, this wasn't a formal class, it was just an association, but he said, you have talents that could make you a great sculptor. And so he followed the lead of this guy, John Rogers. The first piece of sculpture he did was the fawn, later called the fawn first version. Uh, and it was recognized by a guy named Frederick Dillenbaugh. And Dillenbaugh had trained in Europe and also in New York as a younger man. He was probably 20 years younger than Proctor. Uh, and he had gone with Thomas Moran and John Wesley Powell on the Colorado River uh, in 1871, and had come back with paintings not as elaborate nor as famous as, as Moran's. But nonetheless, he had that experience. So he was sort of of this same kind of character. But he was living uh, in, uh, in the, uh, this time, 18, late 1880s, in New York City and practicing as a painter. And he came into Proctor's little studio one day and saw this John Rogers inspired 
first sculpture by Proctor. And he said, we've got to put this somewhere. We can't just leave this uh, for it on your shelf. And so he had the, the, uh, the power to insert this into the annual exhibition at the Century Club, the annual art exhibition at the Century Club. And <clears throat> it got the attention of some pretty powerful figures, including the guy with all the watch, watch fobs coming off of him, watch chains, in the dark suit with his hands in his pocket. And that guy was Frank Millette. And Frank Millette was responsible for, and this was something he'd been assigned uh, in the early 1890s, to do, uh, to see to it that the, the grounds of the Columbian Exposition were covered with wonderful art. And so he brought together a, uh, a group of, of painters and sculptors, uh, uh, in, in, including the guy in the foreground who was uh, Proctor's uh, mentor at the Art Students League. In the, he was the guy in the, in the uh, over, overalls. Do you recognize him? Uh, there were painters. Uh, uh, there was uh, uh, Julian Alden Weir in the foreground on the left and above him, and I understand this doesn't work. So if anybody has another one of these, it would be really helpful. I heard there was one in town. <laughs> uh, but the guy, uh, the guy above uh, of Weir is Herman McNeil on the left there in the second row. And next to him is none other than Daniel Chester French. And above him is Edward Potter. Edward Potter was probably the most boring sculptor in the 19th century. <laughs> but he beat Proctor out on a lot of, of commissions. So he was not a friend. Do you, see, do you see Proctor in the foreground in the light gray suit with his left leg extended, uh, standing ne next to Millette? Oh, Carol, you're amazing. Okay. I don't know what I do with the other one because it's okay. So this is Proctor, this is Millette, J. Alden Weir, McNeil, French, Potter. Uh, this guy is uh, McMoney's, this hand there. McMoney's did most of the sculpt big sculptures uh, at the World's Fair. So this was his team. and. Uh, he wanted, Millet wanted Proctor, uh, along with a guy named Edward Kimes, to do wild animals from the West. Both these guys were from the West. And they were, they were uh, put on, well, this doesn't work. I guess I need the other one back. This one won't change the slide. <laughs> This is ours, right? Okay. Oh, I want both. Yeah. All right. So this is what the World's Fair looked like with all the sculpture. Uh, again, Mc, uh, uh, McMoney's uh, did most of the big things out in there, but but Proctor was supposed to do four different animals: a polar bear, an elk, a moose, and what's the other one? I had it written down somewhere. Elk. And and these are the elk. You can see them in the lower right-hand corner. So uh, they were made of plaster staff, which was a plaster with lots of straw and horsehair mixed in it so that it would, it would be uh, stable. Proctor got done with his assignment very early. Uh, and so they asked him to do two others. Uh, one is a cowboy and one's an Indian. And the Indian looks like he came right off the Buffalo Bill Wild Rush show poster. And the cowboy is actually the first equestrian cowboy sculpture ever made. Uh, the Buffalo Bill Cowboys, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was there. And so this may have been the first association he had with Buffalo Bill because his cowboys didn't like the sculpture. Thought that the cowboy on the horse looked kind of wimpy. And didn't have control of his little horse. And so they decided they would rope it. <laughs> 
and pull it into the lagoon. Can you imagine what the sculpture would look like after it soaked in the lagoon overnight? Well, Buffalo Bill saved art that day. He came to his cowboys and he said, I've heard the rumor that you want to do this and uh, this is not, this is not going to happen. I will be personally upset and you don't want to see me personally upset. <laughs> and so he saved art that day. In fact, these were so popular that they were saved after the World's Fair. Many of these sculptures were destroyed, but these were saved and sent to Denver and put in Denver's new city park. And they lasted for 10 or 12 years. Uh, I've seen a letter from 1913, which is 10 years later, from a fellow artist in Denver saying that those, those sculptures are still there in the park. So I'm going to talk about six, maybe seven, of his sculptures. Uh, and uh, one of the things in this new study uh, of 11 sculptures, it's kind of a connoisseurship study, is an in-depth kind of look at each of these. So uh, we're going to look at uh, sort of an in-depth uh, take. And this is the picture we saw, whoops, this is the picture we saw earlier. And that's why I call it Pat Patting the Panther. Uh, and this was made, this is the clay, but it was eventually cast in, in, in plaster and put on the grounds. <clears throat> and these pieces that were put on the grounds were, there were four of them. Two of them looked opposite directions and the other two looked opposite directions. So it was quite a job. Well, this, is, this was kind of his inspiration to do his, his famous and probably one of his most popular works called The Stalking Panther. And besides the one at the World's Fair, there were six different versions or variations of this. The one on the uh, left was a plaster. We see that I think he cast one bronze of it uh, for an exhibition in, in New York at the Society of American Artists in 1893. But he took this plaster with him to Paris because after the World's Fair was over and his work was done, he and his brand new wife, Modi, went to Paris to study at the Julian Academy. He did, she didn't. She had kids. And they took this, this plaster with him and uh, in Paris, he perfected it and turned out the second version of this bronze or this sculpture. And you see a casting going both ways, but it's the same casting uh, of the second version. Uh, the, uh, the thing you can see lots of differences. The, the one that he did in Paris is bulkier. The, uh, the head is, is more, uh, can, uh, more full. And, and, uh, and on the bottom one, you can see the foot is aimed out to the side. And that's a little bit of a change. There are only two castings of this known. So it's pretty rare that I know of. Uh, and so that must be all that's known, because I know everything. <laughs> this is the one that's the most common. Uh, this is a cast uh, number four from the Metropolitan Museum, cast by Roman Bronze Works uh, after he returns to the United States. And uh, this is, there are, there are a, a number of, of these uh, uh, it, it known. Uh, this is the second, the third variation was done in about 1908. Uh, and uh, this is a Jonathan Williams uh, casting of it. You can't really tell the difference. The only person who could tell the difference is Sandy Church. And that's because he's lined them all up together. <clears throat> I've never done that. But between uh, 1915 and, uh, and uh, uh, 1900, there were about 22 of these cast by Roman Bronze Works, and there were about 45 of them cast after that uh, by uh, Jonathan Williams uh, in New York. One Roman Bronze Works uh, did him in, in uh, Lost Wax, the others were done in Sandcast. And then in 1922, he did a uh, uh, remodeled version of it. The head's a little bit thicker. He, he was uh, he was unhappy with it. He decided he would do two versions. One, uh, a 39-inch uh, a piece and one a 19-inch piece, uh, thinking that the 19-inch piece might sell better uh, and he would have a lot of success with it. Uh, he didn't. 
this is a piece by Kimis, who was the guy who worked with him at the World's Fair. Uh, it's at the Metropolitan Museum, and you can see the difference uh, in approach to the panther. One, uh, a, a, a hunter, uh, a predator, uh, and, the, and the other, a parent. And so you can see Proctor's take on, on these subjects compared to Kimi's. Uh, the next is the fawn, that one we looked at early. There were two versions of the fawn, uh, probably both modeled around 1891 uh, initially. Uh, one on the left is called the fawn first model, and the other one is just known as the fawn. At some point early on, they were combined onto one plinth and uh, were referred to as the orphans. Uh, today, they're qu quite rare. There are less than 10 castings uh, known today of either of them, and maybe it's because they were quite edible. And this is a bron bronze done by Proctor called uh, the uh, Panther with Kill, and you can see the fawn uh, in the foreground. So about the same time, in the late 1880s, 1890s, he was working on a piece that would sort of reflect his own personality better than the fawn, although the fawn, by some art historians, has been referred to as symbolizing Proctor's debut as a sculptor in a very competitive world, uh, New York and Chicago. And so he was vulnerable, he was orphaned in New York, uh, he, all those things. and, and uh, uh, so that's a, a reasonable theory, at least. Uh, that's the one I postulated. <coughs> uh, by this time, 1899, he turns to a, an image of a sculpture uh, that is very much the opposite, uh, of an animal that can survive, even a panther, uh, an animal that can sur survive in, in, in the West. He does this also um, somewhat more sophisticated. He's al already had uh, a number of years of French training. He's also al already worked with Augusta St. Gaudens for a year and a half. And so he, he's a little more confident when he does this sculpture. Uh, this is the guy Gifford Pinchot, who is the head of the National Forest. Uh, our first National Forest is here in Cody, and it's thanks to Gifford Pinchot. And this is who Gifford, his son, was named after. And Gifford liked to... Uh, support now uh, Proctor he probably bought one of the uh, of the elk bronzes and commissioned a number of of these uh, plaques one of which was a bronze plaque of the, of the elk for his uh, estate which we'll see a little bit later Proctor Proctor explored the idea of moose on a number of occasions. Uh, first at the Columbian Exposition. These are the moose that we talked about. Uh, I call them the low rider moose because the way the, the, the rack kind of dips down there. Uh, but it was these moose that got him involved in the Boone and Crockett Club. And the Boone and Crockett Club had been inspired by two fellows, George Bird Grinnell and, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. On an island in the lagoon was, a, was the Boone and Crockett Club cabin, and Proctor was invited over there for lunch one day, and they uh, asked him if he would join this club. Uh, the club had been going since 1888. The first and only other artist in the club was Albert Bierstadt, and the reason he'd been invited into the club was because he shot a moose in New Brunswick uh, in 1880, and uh, it was a very famous moose, it was the largest moose ever, ever shot, or maybe the five, fifth, or sixth largest. Uh, it went to the, it was stuffed and went to the uh, American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York, and he painted. He, Bierstadt himself painted three different versions of his moose uh, for himself and for his patrons. This gave him his reputation as a hunter and also as a uh, as a an artist of animals. Uh, and he was inducted into the Boone and Crockett Club in 1888. 
as the charter member. He was the first member on the list of members uh, in the minutes of the Boone and Crockett Club that met in New York that year. <coughs> Gifford Pinchot, who we've uh, seen already, uh, commissioned him to, uh, for his little house in, uh, it, it called Gray Towers in Milford, Pennsylvania. Uh, he asked him to do a, an overmantel for one of his fireplaces of moose, and he also encouraged uh, him to do a standing, freestanding uh, moose for uh, sale. Uh, there were two of these cast, one for uh, Gifford and one for his sister in London. We've never found the one in London. But Pinchot encouraged him to do a, a freestanding moose, and, and he did one. And you can see it here. It's very perky. It's on the right. No longer a low rider moose. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, two guys beat him to the subject. Uh, one is Henry Schrady in 1900. He did the moose on the upper left. And uh, it was very popular. Lots of people bought it. Uh, and then uh, a guy named <coughs> Carl Rungis decided he would get into the game and he cast the one on the lower left, and then Proctor in, in 1907 did this one. So they're, they're uh, really quite, uh, quite rare. In 1897, uh, Proctor was in Paris, uh, and he uh, wanted to model a buffalo to sort of go along with his elk. And so he did, he went to the local zoo, uh, the Jardin de Plain, and uh, saw this character uh, in one of the displays and decided he would copy it, made sketches. This is a wood buffalo. And so uh, there were a number of these cast. It was very popular, popular bronze. In fact, it was so popular that this fellow, Herbert Pratt, learned about it and asked him if he would do a larger version uh, the first bronze was about 16 inches high. This one was about 40 inches high. And it was to go on to his uh, Long Island, Glen Cove, Long Island estate out front of his house. Uh, the man's name is Herbert Pratt. And you can tell by the size of his cigar that he is the chairman of the board of Standard Oil. <laughs> you can also see in the background that he's already bought a Shrady Moose. Well, that was so. That was such a such a nice relief for uh, for Proctor that he decides to go west to see what buffalo really look like, and and so he goes to uh, Alberta, Canada, to a, a reserve called the Wainwright Buffalo Preserve in Alberta to sketch buffalo, and you see sketches a, a, a set of sketches uh, from the Metropolitan Museum on the left hand side. And he comes back and he fashions his first version of the Q Street, what became the Q Street Buffalo uh, in 1912 or so. And this particular piece, uh, George Pratt, Herbert's older brother who uh, ran the Long Island Railroad, uh, bought, he bought lots of uh, Proctor bronzes, but he bought this one and gave it to the Brooklyn Museum. And it's a little different than all the others, so I call it the first version because it has the buffalo skull in between the, the uh, animal's rear legs. <coughs> you can uh, conjecture what that buffalo skull implies, uh, and I'll let you do that. But most of the pieces look like this one from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, it's a, pr a proud uh, prairie buffalo. And then this is a maquette uh, plaster that we have here uh, in the museum, and it was uh, actually the, the maquette that was used for the Q Street Buffalo uh, in Washington. So, uh, oops. So these others are, are very close, but this one uh, is really the model for that larger one that we talked about a little earlier. And then James Earl Frazier does a buffalo, the buffalo nickel. Poor guy had to crowd this buffalo onto a, a little round circle. <laughs> so uh, the Indian iron tail or whatever his name is looks pretty good, but the buffalo looks a little uncomfortable. <laughs> 
So we turn uh, to uh, a new piece called The Indian Warrior. Uh, in, in 1894, in the fall of 1894, uh, this fellow on the left calls, writes a letter to Proctor and says, you've got to come back to New York. I'm, I'm commissioned to do two big Union generals, one for Chicago, a guy named Logan, and one for, for New York City, a guy named Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman. And I want somebody who knows how to do horses, and I hear you're pretty good at animals and better get a ticket for the next boat. And so he does. He'd been in Paris for just under a year, and he's called back to New York to do these commissions. Uh, when he's finished with these two commissions a year or so later, uh, uh, St. Gaudens gives him a hunting rifle, a Mannlicher rifle, and that rifle is a prize to Proctor. <coughs> And he goes uh, out to Montana to shoot as many animals as he can. Uh, but he also goes out to Montana to uh, go to the Blackfeet Reservation because he has an idea for a, a sculpture that will represent all the things that, that over that year he's learned from St. Gaudens. Three main things. Always in your sculpture use nobility, nobility of character. Second, dignity of expression. And the third, I can't remember, I think it's the Department of Energy. No, no, that's that guy. <laughs> the, the third is simplicity of design.